Please, we will start the next one. The people back there, please. <laughs> So Okay, so we start uh, the second phase of this um, event and we will start this part with, uh, uh, with Giuseppe Juan. Uh, he's a researcher of the Applied Artificial Intelligence Unit at Eurecad and he was at the beginning uh, with the proposal and also at the beginning in the, uh, of the project. So uh, thank you, Josep, for being here. The floor is yours. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Laia. Uh, so welcome, everybody, also the people online. Uh, it's a really pleasure to me to be here today with my old colleagues uh, working the project. So really, really, I was amazed for the, for, I don't know, the, uh, the offer that uh, your team gave to me. So it's a pleasure to come back with you and also a pleasure to, uh, I would say, introduce your, the results that all you team have uh, obtained during the project. Okay? So um, with that, this session now, it's, it's going to bear on the intelligent services of BDGEOS, as has been said. So BDGEOS is integrating a lot of uh, services uh, that are using different sources of data, mainly remote sensing data, but also in field observations from sensors, but also from our partners. So now uh, I think it will uh, be the, the, the time for you to understand better what we have developed in the project. So I will start giving the, the floor also to my colleague Nuria Perez. Uh, she's postdoctoral research at the uh, Earth uh, System Services Group. Uh, from Barcelona Computing Center. So, Nuria, you want to come? Then let me say that there is a space, a space for questions at the end of the session. So, any of you that will want to raise questions for any of the speakers now, th there will be uh, five uh, different people speaking and uh, telling us the, 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 the results of the different services. We'll be at the end of this part, okay? There I think it's uh, kept uh, 10 minutes or, or 15. So just remain in your in your heads, and for the people in the online, you can st you can write whatever you want in the chat. Okay, so please, uh, Nuria, you should you should be closer. Yeah. Thank you, Nuria. So th um, thank you, Joseph, for the for the introduction. Um, I'm going to present the the climate uh, the climate forecast. Uh, service, but also the, some um, information on the co-development part. Um, first, the overview of the of the service as it looks in the platform. Uh, there are three types of uh, forecasts. The first one is the weather forecast, so the user can select uh, the forecast type, the the location, and also a variable. And then the uh, temporal time series appears for showing the forecast for the following three days. And it is uh, updated every day. In the case of the sub-seasonal forecast, um, this, the, you can do the, the similar selection, but it appears uh, the forecast for the following four weeks. And it is updated every week. Um, in this case, the forecast is probabilistic, so we don't provide only w one value. We consider all the possibilities that can happen in the near future, and we summarize it in this uh, type of categories, um, showing if there is probability for the uh, below normal, normal, and above normal conditions, and also in case of uh, extremes, uh, pro very uh, high probabilities of uh, happen uh, extreme, um, it is shown in a dark uh, bar also. Uh, in the case of the seasonal forecast, um, the, the product is similar, it's based on categories, it's a probabilistic result. Uh, this product is updated every month, once a month, and it shows the uh, possible um, climate uh, 
um, escenarios uh, for the following three months. Those, so these, with these three, uh, three types of uh, climate forecast and weather forecast, the idea is to try to anticip anticipate the conditions and, if possible, some of the decisions when managing the banyards. Um, in the case of, of the weather, subseasonal and seasonal climate forecasts that are in the uh, left side of the graph, they can help on, on several of the activities in the vineyards, for instance, uh, to plan the harvest uh, date and, and duration. Um, and maybe you wonder, you wonder why we can or we try to provide these uh, services beyond the typical three days uh, weather forecast. Um, the weather forecast, the thing is that they benefit um, from the initial conditions. So we, we start the execution of a numerical model today, and we only provide information for the following three, maximum seven days. But then the, the predictability, the, the information from which we can um, uh, produce inform useful information, the uh, the case, and um, after that, uh, in the numerical models, we include other sources of uh, predictability. In this case, uh, uh, basically are the land, because the, the variability is uh, slower, and also the ocean, and also the, the changes, the energy exchange between the atmosphere and these and this fields. But in the end, we are far away from the initial conditions, and that's why we have a number of possibilities in the future outcome. Um, so um, so to the, the point of this probabilistic forecast, lead us to, to try to do this co-development, no? because we are used to this uh, the platform that already has a design showing um, specific mm, values for all of these uh, variables. But in the case of this probabilistic forecast, we need to include um, the categories, um, the colors, uh, so we try to make it useful for the users, and then uh, we end up with this configuration of uh, bars. And in the case, um, one of the the important part of this code development is this quality assessment. No, uh, we know that depending on the atmosphere conditions, the status of the ocean, and so on, the predictability is better or. Uh, in, in some part of the year. So when we see that maybe there is no another value for the numerical model, in that case, we show that the skill, that is a, a statistical measure of the quality of the forecast, is shown to inform the users on the, the quality and that maybe they can use or the um, thresholds of this category, because these thresholds for, to determine the categories are uh, calculated in the past, or to look for alternative information for, from the, for instance, for the observations or the, from the historical period. Um, we are happy also to, 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 to work in BTGOs because, in the end, this um, climate forecast has been also used as part of other um, services, uh, the disease uh, forecast and also the phenological forecast. And at BSC, we are still working on, on climate services as a research center, so we keep trying to improve uh, the, the way of communicating, the quality and of, of this forecast, and the usability. So, for instance, uh, there is ongoing a, a project called PISA, and in this um, project, we are working with uh, insurance for the agricultural sector. So how to include this information in other sectors, not only in the agriculture. Um, and we are keep working on research also for next generation of uh, numerical models for climate predictions. Um, I think that's all from my side. Joseph. <laughs> Thank you, Nuria. Thank you. So please keep Keep your questions for Nuria for later. So now we will see on, uh, the results based on, on the binary monitoring and phenology, phenology stage prediction. There will be Tommaso Monop Monopoli and Federico Dani from Lynx, which are uh, uh, artificial intelligence researchers. So please, the floor is yours. Here you have the pointer if you want. 
Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm now. I will. Uh, okay. I will present you the next uh, intelligence services, um, phenology monitoring and and forecast. I'm Federico Aldani, an AI applied researcher at Lynx Foundation, a research center in in Italy. Well, um, we all know that um, understanding the evolution of phenological phases is crucial to optimize vineyard uh, management because there's uh, critical activities in the in the uh, in the vineyard that. Uh, must be based on, uh, on the phenological phase. So having uh, insights about the evolution of phenological phases is, import is important for, uh, uh, for a wine grower. And um, traditionally, uh, the, phenol the um, uh, phenology monitoring uh, is done uh, through manual, through human observation, but we all know that this can be time consuming and uh, very inefficient for very large vineyards or remote vineyards. Another way uh, could be using drones that is an efficient way to monitor the vineyard, but for phenology you need a continuous monitoring over the entire season, and so uh, it can be cost prohibitive. What is remaining is satellite that offers low-cost methods to analyze phenology, especially over large regions, and weather station that consent to gather uh, meteorological data to uh, extract vineyard insights. Now, um, in, in our models, uh, we focused on this, the last two um, methods that I mentioned, satellite data and weather station data. Well, uh, to assist the wine grower to keep track of the evolution of phenological phases in the vineyard, we developed two models. Um, one that integrates vineyard data and weather station data um, that use a deep learning model, machine learning models, to um, give insights about the current phenological phases in the vineyard. And what if if uh, weather station is not available, well, we can, um, we can include uh, satellite data, daily satellite data uh, and vineyard, uh, vineyard data to, um, to give this information. Moving beyond the monitoring of phenological phase, um, we implemented also uh, other two models for forecast the next phenological phase um, up to four weeks in advance. So uh, thanks to the climate prediction that Nuria uh, have just explained, um, we are able to provide information on when the next phenological phases will take place. Uh, we developed two models, one uh, based on machine learning models um, that is specific for, uh, for the vineyard, um, and one, uh, a mechanistic model, a process-based model um, developed by University of Naples that is specific for the variety. Both of the models um, integrates weather session data and climate prediction. So what I presented you today uh, is a complete suite uh, to assist the wine growers to, to monitor and forecast the, the phenology. Um, so it's a complete suite to wine growers to, um, to help the wine growers to make informed decision uh, about the uh, management of the, or of the vineyard. So I concluded with my part, and now I will uh, leave the floor to Tommaso for the next uh, intelligence service. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Tommaso Monopoli from uh, Lynx Foundation, too. Uh, and I am uh, um, an artificial intelligence applied researcher. Uh, within uh, the VTGOS project, 
Uh, we also introduced uh, another uh, monitoring service which leverages uh, drone service. Um, the main advantage of uh, using drones in uh, smart agriculture applications uh, is that they have a higher resolution with respect to other data sources uh, such as uh, satellite data. Uh, this enables uh, the uh, exact delineation of uh, the vineyard rows. Um, and we, can, uh, we can tell the vineyard rows uh, apart exactly from the ground. And it, this enables new opportunities, for example, to develop uh, uh, and compute new vegetation indexes, which can be useful to monitor the growth process of the, of the vines. Uh, specifically, uh, in the context of the project, uh, we uh, acquired uh, RGB images of the involved vineyards and uh, we used them to uh, create a machine learning model, a deep learning model uh, to exactly segment the vineyard rows. Uh, this model, the output of this model was used to develop and compute two new vegetation indexes. Uh, which generally, generally reflect the state of health of a vineyard. Uh, let's take a closer look to the developed vegetation indexes. Uh, the VDI, uh, which stands for Vineyard Density Index, uh, is basically a quantitative measure of the vigor and the thickness of the, of the vines. Uh, we expect uh, VDI values to increase uh, uh, as the vegetative season progresses, so as the vine grows. Uh, and so we can use, for example, this index uh, to monitor uh, growth anomalies. Uh, another one is the VNDY, uh, which is basically an RGB-only proxy for the NDY uh, index, which is commonly used in smart agriculture applications. And this, it is a, a measure of uh, the vegetative stress of the, of the plants. Um, the higher resolution of drones uh, enables to uh, compute the VNDY index separately for the rows and the inter-row area. Uh, the first one is useful to uh, assess the vegetative stress on the vines to check whether the vines are healthy or not. Uh, the second one can be used, for example, to monitor the presence of ground cover vegetation, which uh, is sometimes unwanted during the vegetative season. Um, we can see that uh, drones uh, are, can be one of the best options to, to monitor uh, a vineyard remotely. Uh, one of the most used uh, ways to monitor a vineyard are in-field sensors. But uh, while they provide uh, accurate and frequent measurements, uh, they can be very expensive to install uh, on the whole vineyard, and uh, they require frequent maintenance. Uh, satellites, on the other hand, uh, can scale well to larger vineyards, but they suffer from low resolution, and I'm talking of uh, uh, non-commercial uh, satellites in this case, uh, and uh, they, uh, they are not operational in the, in the presence of clouds. Uh, instead, drones uh, offer a very higher resolution, and uh, although we cannot fly them every day because it would be financially infeasible, uh, we discovered within the project that uh, just a few flights, maybe five or six flights during the vegetative season are enough to effectively um, monitor the, the growth process of the vines. So uh, we argue that drones can be the best option for, for example, small or medium-sized vineyards. And let's take a look uh, at this example uh, on why drones can be really a game changer in uh, smart viticulture and in monitoring vineyards. Uh, on the left, there is an image uh, taken from an infield camera uh, of a parcel. Uh, we can see that the, basically the, the, the vines are vigorous and uh, very healthy, uh, while there is no ground cover vegetation at all. 
Um, the, the, the NDVI computed from uh, a satellite, in this case a Sentinel-2, which is a, a, a very coarse resolution of uh, 10 meters per pixel, cannot distinguish, uh, the, they cannot tell apart the, the, the vineyard rows from the ground cover. Uh, whereas, when we take a look to the VNDY computed from the drone image, uh, this brings much richer information because we can, it correctly reveals that uh, uh, the vines are very healthy and there is no ground cover vegetation at all. Uh, the same argument applies for other indexes, for, for example, the, the vineyard density index that we introduced. Uh, we compared it in this case with the leaf area index uh, computed from Sentinel-2 and the same argument applies because uh, uh, the resolution of Sentinel-2 is not enough to, um, to exactly uh, tell the spots uh, uh, where uh, the, the, veget the, the vines are uh, denser or less dense. As for the provision of the service, um, we require wine growers to, uh, to provide us uh, one or more ortho images of the, the vineyards to analyze. And uh, we provide as an output uh, high resolution heat maps of uh, the vegetation indexes that I introduced, as well as the georeferenced uh, GOT files, which can be used for further analysis, for example, with uh, any GIS software. Um, a final remark on the service, and in particular on the segmentation model that we created. It supports uh, a wide range of uh, image resolutions, uh, from one to 10 centimeters per pixel. And most of all, is, uh, it, it works really well and is very robust to suboptimal visual conditions and visual heterogeneity in the ortho images acquired uh, from the drone. And, and this may be due, for example, to different uh, light exposures, uh, uh, different uh, differences in soil composition. Uh, there may be the presence of shadows projected by tall objects uh, like trees uh, and so on. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Tommaso. <laughs> Thank you for this good explanation. Then uh, I will give the floor now to Alex Pujol, researcher in, the, in Eurecat, in the same unit as I am. So he will uh, explain to us the mildew and powdery mildew prediction and treatment recommendation service that we develop also during the project. So Alex. Okay. Thank you, Joseph, for your introduction. Um, as Joseph said, my name is Alex. I work in, in Eurecat in the Artificial uh, Intelligence Applied uh, Unit. So I'm going to be explaining today to you this service of disease forecast. Okay, in this in this service, we are uh, trying to as Fran explained us in the, the keynote uh, session, try to search and uh, the up uh, the appearance of these these diseases that are very infectious for uh, for viticulture and are important to treat in time uh, our approach in order to to try to do this forecast will be database uh, we will try to use uh, AI algorithms to um, read through uh, learn through historical data as well as uh, user data to try to predict these, these diseases and we will make use of the weather forecast and climate forecast and to try to give an answer for the following days, weeks and even months. Okay, so the two main objectives of this service that we are, uh, that we are, that I am presenting today uh, will be an early warning service. Okay, so we'll try to see when the disease is going to appear. We will try to uh, warn the user and as well as uh, provide with um, sustainable management recipes that would be um, which treatments should be applied and, and in which quantities they should be applied, okay? And we will focus on, uh, on two diseases. So we will take data from two diseases, which will be powdery mildew and downy mildew, which are the two most uh, prominent diseases that appear on, on vineyards. 
Okay, so here's a general overview of the of how the service is uh, is uh, designed. Okay, so uh, we use uh, location weather for location weather as an input for the for the models, as well as the uh, current uh, vine states in uh, in the sense of the phenological models that uh, just Federico and Thomas just explained, and as well as field observation from the um, uh, from the wine growers uh, to f to fit this model. So the um, the main way of trying to predict uh, these diseases um, in in these past years has been through the use of mechanistical models that were designed uh, some years ago um, by great researchers and based on the information they they had uh, and on the weather information they had on on, on their times, but. In these last years, especially in the, um, in the context of climate change, so the climate is, is behaving much differently uh, today. So we are trying to uh, come up with new, with new tactics, with new models, uh, taking advantage of these um, great technologies that we have now uh, based on AI. And this is what we, we, will, try, we will try to do in this, uh, in this service. So the idea is to predict the the leaf index area affected by the diseases based, as I explained to you uh, before, in climate and weather predictions, but uh, also in these models also use phenological predictions, which also give a new layer um, for, these, for these models. Okay, then the, the outputs that we try, we try to, to give are the, the risk index, okay, we, we will uh, define the risk in three categories depending on the on the in the, on the in incidence of the um, of the disease that we are measuring, as well as the treatments and recommendations uh, based on that uh, on that index. Okay. Um, here's just a small example on how a user would get the data once they. Um, when, once the calculations are done, basically we, we will see we see that here we are using subseasonal uh, weather predictions, weather forecast, uh, subseasonal uh, climate forecast. Sorry, which uh, gives us uh, an estimation of what of what the climate will be in the following weeks. We will see that we uh, we are working uh, week week to week and the same month, and we see that the results of the uh, of the models give a low, medium, and high risk depending on, uh, on, the, on the climate uh, data and um, the user will get which treatment should apply and in which doses should apply it. Okay, we now we'll see more or less which are the, um, uh, the, the levels at which we uh, assess that risk. We see that the, this, in this graph you can see the, the predictions that the model does in this case, on a daily basis, we see that the day of the year is on, on, on the x-axis, and the y-axis we have the incidence in in the leaf area. Okay, the incidence of the disease. We see that the, uh, when the season starts, when the when the phenological um, phases start to happen, the model uh, starts to detect possible um, possible affectations of the of the disease, possible apparitions of the disease, and pre predicts that the disease will be in certain, in certain states. The, the black trend, that this is the real, the real trend that the real data is following, actually, and the red dots would be the prediction. Uh, as you can see, the variability is, uh, is a bit high. It's still, uh, there's a, uh, a bit of a higher scatter, but the, the trend is followed. Um, in a more or less sensible, sensible way. Um, here are a bit of the, uh, the, mean, uh, the mean error results uh, for the, the, three, the, six, the six models that we did. Remember that we were trying to predict uh, for downy mildew and powdery mildew, uh, and for three different time horizons. No? So we are, we're working for short term, subseasonal, and seasonal. As you can see, the, uh, the indicators are worse as the as we try to predict in a higher and a longer um, periods of time. So for example, when we're trying to predict seasonal, then the variability is much, much higher. 
Uh, this also comes with the difficulty of predicting this, this kind of, uh, of months in advance. And, and yeah, this is more or less the, uh, the, the results that, that we have in this, uh, on this service. In terms of the platform, just uh, afterwards, Jessica will show you a little demonstration of the platform. The user would access the platform, would access one of their, uh, one of their plots, and they could uh, have a bit overview of, of the predictions in terms of the different uh, diseases, as well as the when the, the date is expected to, to happen, the, um, the prediction. They would have the which risk the, the, um, they have of the apparition of the disease and, and a recommended uh, recommended uh, treatment. So yeah, this was a, uh, an overview of the service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Now um, I will give the floor to Jessica Snoek, which is a project manager in agriculture in, in ELIF. Uh, so he, sorry, she will explain <laughs> to us uh, the weekly crop uh, uh, status indicators. Um, so the floor is yours, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you. Here you have the pointer if you need. Yeah, perfect. Um, good day, everyone. My name is Jessica. Um, as Josep said, I uh, work for eLeaf, and we are responsible within this project for all of the data that is satellite dependent. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about it. We're also responsible for the platform. I will go through that later on. Um, so I think. Thanks to the introduction of the entire day, you should all know a little bit more about satellite data. So thank you for that introduction. That saves me a good 20 minutes. Um, so what we do is we use satellite data, but also add all of the remote sensing components that are easily scalable to those data sets to facilitate data all around the world. Um, so ELEAF is actually supporting data on all of the continents, um, so yeah, Southern Europe and high resolution data seem to be the best fit for this project. Um, so there's different data components that come into place here. We don't just use the um, RGB, the spectral images that are visible by the naked human eye. We also use the multispectral images. Um, we use weather data to compensate for all of these specificities um, that are occurring when the satellite comes over. So you can see that the land surface temperature has a very big role in the top left, but also NDVI, albedo, etc. cetera. Um, but we do really need to take into account every time the satellite comes over to compensate for the relative humidity, the air temperature, all of that. So that means that besides the satellite data, and for this project, we're mostly focusing on Sentinel-2. So we've got two A and B, so we've got adequate data. Um, we have been running Sentinel-5 in the back. Um, Landsat 8 and 9 are always active on our end, especially looking at the longer time series in the beginning of the project, it was quite useful to have an extensive data set to see what the trend lines are and whether or not our evapotranspiration data um, coincides with the local edicovariant stations. Um, so yeah, we've been running that as well. And then to support that for the longer time series that we didn't have from the meteorological stations, we also had MODIS and VIRS running, so those were all the satellite, all of the Copernicus uh, data sets in place. Um, what we do, um, we use a water and energy balance. Our ET look model, um, which is the second version of the first SABOL model, which is the FAO used evapotranspiration model. Um, so all of the United Nations evapotranspiration data comes out of our ET look model. Um, it runs on Penman Monteith and it has the water and the energy balance as a basis. For this project, what do we do with it? We wanted to zoom in and as being said before, um, drones can zoom in a lot further, um, but you have to fly them, you have to operate them, sorry. Um, they take a lot of manpower. Luckily for us, there's tons of satellite data available. Um, actually plenty so we can facilitate all of those separate crop status indicators on a weekly basis for Vitreos. Um, on the right hand side you see what that can look like when you put on the segmentation tab so we can also segment and spatially provide you with an idea of what is happening in the vineyard. I will go into details on the platform a little bit later. Um, but this helps 
to kind of make the maps look like the soil maps um, that the end users are quite used to receiving from the drones. So with those energy balance and the water balance, um, we can give an idea on the biomass actually being produced. That does mean because of the spatial resolution that we take into account everything that grows, so also your intercrops. Um, so then it becomes interesting that if something occurs, if there's something out of the ordinary or if something changes in your vineyard, um, to fly the drone. So it can also add on to each other to combine those sources. Um, another parameter that we developed throughout the course of this project is using the weather data that Nuria explained in the beginning. Um, so normally we only display data of the past days that has actually been occurring on the satellite. Um, for this, we tried and make a crop water demand to predict the water need of the vines for the week following. So we include the 10 days weather forecast to tell what will be the amount of millimeters per week that the vine will need for the next week to support irrigation um, applications. So what we have is quantified data, so not just a vegetation index such as the NEVI or the NDRE. Um, it's actually in millimeters per week, in tons per hectares, provides information on the actual production of the vine. Um, we got the spatial maps in there. We got the color coding system, which I will show you a little bit better later on in a demo. Um, and we have all of that data, hopefully as intuitively displayed in the platform as possible, co-designed with all of the end users. Um, so for this project, we have been running all of those key crop indicators. Uh, there's eight in total. We also have a statistical yield model running next to it, which is not based on the evapotranspiration model. So that's a separate thing. Um, and we have been using the data connection between the different services, such as the weather data, to develop more specific indicators that uh, can help the management practices throughout the season. Um, we are delivering weekly data, which was decided early in this project. Um, we deliver data every single week of the year. Um, that means that even out of season could be interesting to, to check the data uh, for some of the users. Um, it also means that there is interaction going on within all of the services, also out of season. Um, so there is data available year round. Um, and I think that's the most important part. I'll show you the platform later on. Um, Alex, the floor is yours again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you, Jessica. I was having issues with the microphone. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for this explanation. Now it's the turn set by Alex, who will explain us the task scheduling uh, service applied for the uh, uh, optimization of, of, uh, of a scheduling task in the management of, of vineyards. Okay, so Alex, again, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Josep. Uh, hello again. Uh, no need to introduce myself anymore. Uh, so this this la uh, last intelligent service of the of the project. Uh, we'll be focusing basically on business and sustainability data. This is a, like a special service for me at least because it's a, more of a standalone service within the project. This, the aim of this service is a little bit to give more information to the end user, try to get uh, the most of, uh, of its own resources, of its own, of its own data, and also try to keep in track no, with the, the, the sustainability indicators that that they have on the on the company for the uh, from the past years and try to uh, improve on that okay so the uh, the quick overview of this uh, of the service okay it's a little bit divided in in two uh, into um, categories is one is more focused on uh, business data which uh, basically will try to use uh, the data from the u the user in the sense of uh, which task the user has to perform on, on the different plots and try to use this information which work teams you know, the user has available uh, and try to optimize this process within the, all the plots the user have to work in. in, the, in 
to be precise, in, the, in this, this project, we, we apply this model for uh, shoe positioning tasks, uh, we, so, so, sorry, <laughs> soil cleaning tasks, and har uh, harvesting logistics. Okay, the, um, but the, the model is, is made in a general sense that can be applied to um, different tasks performed uh, on, the, on, the, on the sector. Okay, and the, the output of this, of this process would be a calendarization of when these work teams have to go to, the, to, the, to do this, this task or when this, these things have, have to be done in an in a optimal way. You know? we, we can optimize, uh, we will see a little bit more um, ahead, but we, we can prioritize different, uh, different things for, for, the, for each user. Uh, the other part of the service would be uh, the sustainability data uh, KPIs, let's say. Uh, this this part of the the, the service ba basically looks to uh, keep track of all the sustain these sustainability indicators that the users have. Okay, so mainly collecting data from from all the years of uh, of working and even in, in two of the KPIs, which we will see uh, a little bit ahead, we do a small calculations. Okay, based on uh, machin machinery sensors or satellite images. Um, to calculate them and just to give the the end user a more informed view of their their actions on on the on on, on their their farms okay so uh, speaking about the business model okay what what does this this model do or try to do try to give uh, which service tries to give to the to the users so uh, this model uses uh, a set of information given by the the um, the farmer, which basically is a list of different tasks that has to have to be performed. This task could be uh, from uh, applying fertilizers, from uh, cutting uh, cutting herbs, or or shoot positioning, or or even uh, organizing uh, tractors to go pick up um, uh, the product. And also gives the, the the user also gives a set of working teams that that have to do this kind of task, no? And each of these, each of these uh, agents, let's say the OG of these objects of the, of the scenario, the input, has some properties, like how much work extension does it have, if it has a priority or not, the time window needed to do this task, okay? And also the teams have their own, their own properties, like how fast can they work, no? The economical cost, environmental costs. Okay, and all this information concentrated in a, what we call an a scenario, which is like, okay, I need to organize all of this, is fed uh, into an, an AI model, okay, which is based on search algorithms, and it has different kind of construction heuristics and meta heuristics that will try to take all this, all this uh, mess and, and give an organized and optimized calendar, okay, and basically, we feed all, all this information uh, as well as our start day, obviously. We, we have to know when to start the, um, applying these, uh, these tasks. And we have the, the, the user has the, the option to prioritize if we want to give a more uh, economical solution, the, like the, the most economical solution. If he tries to search for the, the, the solution that has the, less, the least environmental impact, or even the is more or for even for the user, for example, it's more important to do the task as fast as possible. No? So we try to prioritize time. No? This is a choice that the end uh, user has. And more or less, the results would be uh, the different set of tasks uh, that need to be done on a daily basis, and when do, the, do these teams need to work on these tasks? Okay, this is a little bit of the uh, the idea behind this. Uh, behind this this part of the of the, uh, the the service, okay. The other part would be the sustainability KPIs part. Okay, here I just left the, the list that the of the KPIs that um, we we decided uh, alongside with the users that that felt they were more important for them that that they wanted to keep track of. Uh, this service basically gathers all these informations of the user um, along, a year, along the past years. It could be in a either monthly or, or yearly uh, basis. Okay, as you can see, there are uh, productivity KPIs based on uh, yield uh, per fertilized use, yield per uh, human labor um, uh, used. They are um, 
KPIs also in, in water usage, in different um, resources used, like fertilizers, pesticide. Um, and we have also a little bit of part of our business, uh, business KPIs, which basically um, talk about cost per hectare or benefits per hectare. Uh, if the user wants to keep track of this, this is um, optional, but uh, it could be interesting. And there are two of the KPIs, which basically are uh, the CO2 uh, emissions and, and the risk of erosion that are calculated uh, on the background. Okay, thanks to, uh, for example, CO2 emissions are calculated um, thanks to information that, uh, and sensors, sorry, that are um, distributed on the, on the tractors. And with um, geospatial data, we basically um, read all the, the time that the tractor is on the field actually working, and we try to take this information along with the calculations of how much um, CO2 emissions the, the tractor is doing and give uh, this information. And for the risk of, er of erosion, we basically use data from uh, Sentinel-2 in a very basic um, exploration in which we try to find the spots that have the lower vegetation index for a long period of time. For example, if you, if you have a very low vegetation index for three, four months, uh, the risk of this area being eroded is higher than, than the rest. No? With vegetation, uh, the, the soil stays um, less eroded. And this is also information that is given um, to the user. Uh, this, coming back to the, um, the, business, the business model, these are a bit of the, some uh, results that we have with this, with this model. Okay? If, you, if you see the, the first three um, the, the first three graphics show um, for different time, type of uh, prioritizations, let's say. You know? let's say th we have the fast prioritization in blue, the economical prioritization in, in orange, and the, and the more ecological prioritization in green. And we can see that the, the days to finish the task are, very, are much quicker on the fast and rather than the economic and, ecolog and ecological. Uh, but in, in terms of uh, economic cost, the fast, for example, is, is much more expensive than the economical, no? and, and, and the ecological, we, saw, we also see that the, the costs are higher, but in, t in the sense of uh, emissions are, are zero, basically, because in this case, actually, it was, uh, there were different kinds of teams, some working with uh, machinery and some without, so the ones working without uh, have a very, uh, uh, basically, uh, no, no, um, no impact, uh, ecologically speaking, but have a higher cost because they take much more time to, uh, to do the job. Uh, also, for example, here in this case, we have multiple priorities. We can say that some tasks want to, we want to do as quick as possible, so they are prioritized uh, on the earliest days. And some of them are prioritized more in the basis of, of economical cost. And also, there, there is a few other properties that I didn't speak about too much. To I didn't get into detail too much. But for example, there is one property also in the in the service that you can select when a, uh, you can prioritize the the tasks by by a certain indicator. In this case, we we did it for a harvest use case in which we tried to prioritize those grapes that were above the the optimal the optimal degree of prioritization, in which we, which we can see that we try to. Um, harvest most of the grapes on this kind of, on, on the, the more optimal and, and sugar degree um, in, in time. No? So, okay, and this is it. This is a little bit of just the visualization in the platform, basically, in which you have uh, all the teams that have to work on all the tasks here in the, in the y axis. These teams can be configurable, um, as well as the tasks, they are all. Uh, customizable and basically you you can launch this these processes and try uh, many different changes this is a kind of simulation that you can do before actually doing the task you can maybe try to say okay what if I we had another team working here what if we have two more teams what if one of the teams instead of having five people uh, was seven people in which case it would, it would work faster and this would give you a different kind of uh, calendarization in, in which you could I have um, some kind of uh, inform more information about the tasks that you have to perform. And this is it for this service. I give the floor to Jessica again. Thank you. Thank you, Alex.
Now, um, meanwhile, the, the team is preparing the, the screens because it will be a live demo, if I'm not wrong. So we will be connected with a real platform that is online. Um, Jessica uh, will present us all the functionalities. So we will see uh, uh, in, in real time what the data that of, of the platform and an example of one of the demo sites that, that is involved in the project. So uh, yeah, I think it's everything is ready. So I give the floor to Jessica to pr to show it. Yeah, okay. So yeah, this is the platform. So Jessica, thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah. So we'll go through the platform. I need to speak louder, do I? Yeah. Sorry. That's usually not the case. <laughs> um, I'll go through the platform and show where all of the services are fit in. Um, the platform, the basis of the platform, is something that uh, from eLeaf side we use for different clients and different commodities. Um, so for this project, we made it completely Fidigeo specific, um, and we made space for all of the separate things that were just presented to find a place in the platform. Together with all of the end users, um, we tried to make it as intuitive and as user-friendly as possible. Um, so I will show you what we came up with so far. Um, to give you an idea, I logged into one of the estates that belongs to Masco Bergardino. It's called Ayanico Estates. Um, I can go to another one as well. Um, Within this estate, they have four separate farm groups, uh, and we selected one of them. What the platform does, it moves to that farm and shows, it shows you a first idea of what is happening for the week that has been selected. Um, so to make this a little bit more interesting, uh, we are looking at mid-season last year, um, because the data is kind of homogeneous now, there's not much growing. Um, so we're looking at the beginning of August, uh, August uh, week 32, and we are looking at the parameter, the biomass production in kilograms per hectare. Um, you can see that the fields have different colors. Uh, this is because we want to give a quick overview of which field is relatively higher or lower performing than the other ones. We only compare them now for the biomass production for that week for the fields with the same variety of grape. So we do not compare fields with different varieties um, as per request of the end users, because they would differ anyways, and that would be acceptable. They might have different harvest moments, etc. cetera. Um, so when selecting a field, you get the basic information of that field provided by the end user. Um, so we do know the orientation of the field, um, the size kind of irrigation system, if there is any irrigation in place. Um, this also helps us in the back end to see which fields are irrigated and which are not, and to quickly move to the certain uh, type of data that we would like. So all of the information that the owner, the, um, the farmer has, can be put in here. Um, some of the farms have more information than other ones. It's, uh, yeah, it depends on, on what is available and what is preferred. Um, in this quick overview in the bottom, uh, you can also see the quantitative data components of that field that has been selected, which kind of disappeared here. Um, so it gives you an idea of the data parameters, and it also includes the color coding system again. So the NEVI is here, which has been widely talked about um, and quite known. Um, but it also provides a place for the phonology, um, and the video is here as well, right, Marina? Can I? Yes, we not sorry. No, that's fine. Okay. Can we do another service? Yeah, sure. Um, so as oh, we can we can do that later. Otherwise, okay. um, so because we're now out of the season and it synchronizes with the API of so the computer system of Lynx. Um, currently, we don't have any forecast. Um, but if there is a forecast for the phonology during the season, there will be different months um, and different dates presented here. It also allows the end user to put in the actual date that the phonology changed, um, so we can save that in the system too. In this field, there is information available as well by one of the field cameras that also has a place in the platform, um, so you can go through that. And then you can select a different date if you want to have a look at another image. Um, there's also the disease management, which Alex showed already. Um, you can select 
the time series here um, if you're interested to look at the short-term forecast for downy or powdery mildew or the seasonal forecast. Um, and then there's one more. The sustainability finds its place here as well. So it's an overview um, and you can select the season that it is run for. Um, and you can display it below here. Um, a little bit more information about the fields and the data per field um, is provided when you either double click or when you go to the tab here. No. Mm -mm. Yep. Um, so there's a ton of data here, which is now not showing. No. Um, that is being displayed in different ways. So this might be a little bit overwhelming. If it's interesting for you to see how the biomass um, links actually to the leaf area index, those are the two parameters that you can select. Um, if it's not the leaf area index you're after, but it's the crop water demand, for example, that's the parameter that you can select. Um, down below, per parameter here, we have the spatial overview, the maps, um, and you can open them, you can download them, you can work with them, um, and they have the spatial information here. So this is the 10 meter resolution that is supplied by the satellite data. Um, the drone data comes in a separate platform because of its interval and um, yeah, interaction with that kind of data. Um, I'll reload it because it seems to have a timeout. Come on, Wi-Fi. There we are. Okay, so now we're back to this week again, uh, which is fine. So what you can actually do, and this is mostly used to uh, useful for our users that are a little bit more remote sometimes, or people that like to bring their laptop into the field, you can also pull the data offline so you can work with it in a different way. Um, as Alex showed, the business tool has a place in here as well, um, but you can also add a team, add a task, all of those specifics. You can also make sure that your people don't work during the weekend, all of those different things we uh, gave a place in here as well. Um, the disease does not just uh, give you the different forecasts, uh, but it also you can also make it more interactive by not having to log into the platform and having to select a field and then having to look what the seasonal forecast is telling you. Um, you can just put in your email address and we will tell you, hey, something changed, have a look. Um, makes it a little bit easier that way. Um, the phenology, um, there's an explanation here for the, yeah, we'll show, we'll give you an idea of what it looks like when we're in season. We just downloaded it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you cannot see this. Is this one no? It should be today. That's the Yeah, and you blow it right in fire. Yeah, yeah. Come on. There it is, yeah. That's okay. Um, yeah. So to give you an idea of what it does look like, uh, this is one of our information videos. So we made different videos of all of the services so people can learn about the service without needing us um, at every given moment. So these are the different uh, phenological models that are running within Vitigeos and this is what a prediction could look like when you're in the season. Um, so since we have different models currently still running, um, there's different predictions that you get, and sometimes they overlap, and sometimes they have a few days in between. Um, and what we then have been asking throughout the duration of the project is for the end users to actually tell Federico what day um, the bud break actually happened, or what day the fruit actually did set, so they could calibrate and uh, improve the model. Um, yeah, so this is what it looks like if there is a forecast within the season. Um, then there's a few more. The Weather and Climate Service has a separate page in here as well. So we do have the short-term data forecast for the next following days, um, but there is also a sub-seasonal and a seasonal forecast. Um, this is the way that's displayed um, that we found was most useful together with the end users. 
Um, so we're currently looking at the temperature that is being predicted for the following weeks um, and the percentages that it's likely to occur. Um, so you can also select, for example, the rainfall if that's what you're after. Um, and it will show you the data that it has. If it doesn't have any data, um, it will not make random predictions, um, which can sometimes happen with when we're looking months and months ahead. Sometimes the system needs a little bit more um, input for it to be more accurate. Um, so the weather and climate is in here as well. It can also be downloaded offline and work with there. Um, then the graph, the single field, and the statistics, and the overview are all of the data components that are linked to the satellite-based data. Um, so this is just different ways to visualize the, uh, the data that we have put into the platform. Um, some of them could be a little bit more advanced to work with, um, and we see that sometimes it takes a little bit longer for the end users to get used to the type of data or to, to get used to the kind of quantitative values that are in there. Um, so as you can see, we're now in this current week, and it's not really interesting to look, like, <laughs> to look at um, data-wise as it is compared to earlier in the season. Um, but yeah, it, uh, we can clearly see that the more people use it, the more they know what a certain quantitative value means on their specific farm. Um, then I think I am all done. Yeah. Any? Thank you, yes. Thank you Jessica. No, just please stay here. So, yeah, so I will ask now, uh, sorry, yeah, let's go upstairs. I will ask now to all speakers to come here in our demo so we will be able to open the floor for, que for questions from the public here in the room and also online. I will try to check the chat online and translate also the questions to you. I think that there are a couple of micros, one could be for you and you could share it and the other for the public. So, I I see some questions, so please, the, the people online can start or can continue uh, writing the question. So I don't know who, there is any question from the room or we can start with a chat? No, yes? Ah, yeah. So we will start with a question in the room. So uh, you hear me? Yeah. yeah. My question is for Federico. Um, you were talking about the deep learning model that you use for the prediction of the phenology stage, so the classification. Can you provide any insight in what kind of deep learning architecture did you use, or is there something if you published some something about that, and where did your training data come from? Oh, okay. 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 Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, we um, we have um, a couple of publication about this this model. Um, in Technical speaking is a um, recurrent uh, neural network, a gated recurrent neural network. Um, for the data that we used, um, we, uh, we asked uh, to the end user to provide us uh, some historical phenology data about the vineyards uh, uh, for about five years in the past. So we, um, we train our models over this data and uh, specific for, for the varieties that uh, they, uh, they provide us. So that is for the ground truth data of when it's uh, actually changing, but what about the input data that you're using? Okay, you work? mean the input data? For the input data, uh, also in this case, we had um, uh, uh, interaction with the end user to integrate in our platform, in our uh, backend, uh, the weather station um, that the end user have uh, in the in their field. Um, so, in also in this case, we had uh, the historical uh, weather station data, and uh, for uh, for the models that use, for example, satellite data, uh, we we used the historical satellite data uh, that we had from uh, since uh, 2017. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will see it now to the chat. One question on the chat, then we can move the mi microphone in the room if there is another question. So again, for you, uh, Link's team, Federico and uh, Tommaso. For you, Federico, the, uh, one question from Marco Moreto. 
uh, how much the satellite data alone are able to explain the phenology? Um, <laughs> yes, it's, um, it's an interesting question. Uh, there's lots of research behind. Um, at the end, we, we found um, we use satellite data. Uh, specifically, we use uh, uh, a satellite that provides us uh, information about the ground temperature um, every day. Uh, at the end, we uh, developed a model that use this information, um, integrate this information with the history of the, of the vineyards to um, model the behavior of, uh, of phenology. So we can say if, uh, if as uh, an exceptional year for, uh, because it's, uh, it's, hot, it's hotter than, than ever, uh, we can anticipate, the model can know that uh, probably the phenology is anticipated for, uh, for that year. Thank you. Thank you, Federico. Um, any other question from the room? Yeah, if I would I'd suggest that you present or at least give your names to the public. Hello, yes, my name is Kasia Dubla. I'm a wine educator, mainly here in Penedès. And my question is more from the point of view of the wine growers, maybe. So about the accessibility of this technology, is it what is being done um, to raise awareness, to make people know that it exists and to make them understand it? Um, because it can be when we look at it like that, a little bit complicated and difficult. So um, how do you promote it? And, and the other question, do you have any feedback or do you measure feedback about the satisfaction of your end users? Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, getting people to understand how, how all of it works is a, is a daily challenge. Um, usually what works best is to have someone that is already trustworthy in the environment, like a consultant or something uh, similar to, uh, to a consultant position to work with that kind of data. So the presentation that we had earlier this morning as well, just throwing data over the vents is usually not really useful. Um, so training, having videos about every single tool that we make, um, having um, for different services, for example, we have weekly or bi-weekly interactive sessions where end users can ask us questions for this project. It has been a lot of surveys, um, forcing people to really use it and also to really monitor and track what people are using. Um, so we also did find that some of the tools were hardly used um, in the beginning and then asking, no one's actually checking out this page, what's happening? And then it needed a total redesign. Um, so that was a lot of the, the effort, uh, efforts made during the design phase of the project. Um, but moving forward and hopefully getting more people included, um, it's having a perfect manual interactive videos and making sure that there's a lot of information available on request without needing too much interaction. But it's definitely the biggest challenge. People that are well informed tend to stick around longer, tend to be a lot easier clients than people who are quickly overwhelmed, have a poor introduction to the service, and yeah, they tend to log in twice and then leave it as is. Thank you, Jessica. Um, I have no question in the chat, but yeah, we can address uh, what's in the room first. <laughs> Hello, uh, this is Alberto Garcia speaking from the Institute of Space Studies of Catalonia. I have a question for Tommaso, but it's a general comment maybe. Um, we are seeing that satellite data, it's getting better with better time and special resolution. Um, but I want to ask you about complementarity because at some point uh, for decision making, maybe uh, you have to have a continuous monitoring by satellite data for uh, your vineyards and then uh, at a specific point where you see something, uh, maybe you have to go down and, and, and have a drone there uh, uh, taking more parameters. Uh, satellite images and hyperspectral images will, are, are, are getting better, but at, at the moment I think it's a complementary uh, problem that you need to solve, uh, the, the challenges you have with different and, and in situ terrestrial sensors as well. So this is a, a comment uh, just yeah. for you to know. So what do you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm, 
basically, uh, I just talked about uh, non-commercial satellites. Uh, we focused on uh, Sentinel-2 data, uh, which is uh, 10 meters per pixel of resolution. Uh, but we uh, didn't investigate in other uh, satellite data sources. For example, uh, some commercial satellites uh, go up to like uh, also 50 centimeters per pixel, uh, which is very high for a satellite. Um, and it, it could be very interesting to see uh, how effective these kind of satellites are for uh, smart agriculture applications. Um, the, the fact is that they are very expensive solutions and we didn't have, uh, uh, th that's why we didn't investigate on them. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I agree with your comment uh, in the sense that uh, <coughs> For now, satellites are a complementary solution, but uh, as uh, resolution will get higher, and maybe there there will be mm, more data avail availability uh, of satellites with a higher resolution, uh, maybe sat satellites will become better. Another problem of satellites, uh, of optical satellites in particular, is that uh, they are not, uh, they cannot operate in the presence of clouds. So it, it is true that there is a um, continuous monitoring, but uh, not in, for example, in very cloudy, uh, in very cloudy places. Mm -hmm. uh, a solution may be using SAR satellites, which can see through clouds. And uh, uh, there are some works in literature which uh, use SAR satellites uh, to uh, to compute some vegetation indexes, uh, but we did not investigate uh, uh, on these topics, uh, and that was mainly because of uh, uh, of time constraints, basically. Okay. Uh, Maybe just to add one thing, um, also because it's an EU-funded project, um, and there's a focus of Copernicus in there. Uh, the Sentinel satellites were the the first choice, of course, within this project. Um, but we do actively also use Sentinel-1 um, outside of this, but um, so that, that does have a radar component and that can facilitate extra data sets, of course. Um, but yeah, continuous research and it keeps getting better and better. So that could be a potential addition. But early on in the project was decided that Sentinel-2 was going to be the main focus point and 5 and 1 are being run in the background, but not actively for all services and uh, to support all of that. Okay, thank you. This makes sense, and and it's it's also true that the complementarity is also in space. So, big programs like Copernicus, which invest a lot of money but have a higher pixels, could complement with new space satellites that different uh, governments, like the government of Catalonia, is now deploying, and it's free of usage. and And we are deploying multi-spectral uh, resolution cameras, so through the clouds, as you say. And at some point, uh, this is something that could be costly, but new space, small satellites are not so costly, and, and governments are putting money there, so just for you to know that this is something that, that will revolutionize uh, space and, and applications like agriculture and viticulture. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, we see it occurring more and more, and I hope that it, it, it will be picked up, I think, more in Horizon 2020 projects to open up more to um, governmental space services as well and to, to include that more. I think there's tons more outside of Sentinel to, to be explored. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for the questions. Uh, there are maybe space for a couple of questions. There are two in the chat. I will give you them also space. One, I think that one can be answered by you, uh, Jessica. So is the solution you presented open access in terms of technology? What are the main components? I would say, I would say technology is behind and if it's, if it's based on open source? Um, so the platform itself is not open access. Um, the platform is a final product uh, product of the VTGEOS project. Um, moving forward, um, you can 
wait till next session and uh, Magda from PricewaterhouseCooper will tell you all about our future plans. Um, regarding the things that were developed and researched within the project, um, a lot of it is actually um, quite well reported and uh, there's um, tons of publications on it, um, especially talking on behalf of links on my left hand side, uh, you've done quite some um, documentation on the phenology models. Um, our ET loop model is completely open. Um, the, you can find it on the United Nations FAO. It's, it's the VAPOR uh, model, so that's open. Um, and I think, Nuria, you've also published quite a bit um, yeah, on, on your services as well. So, yeah, there, there's quite a lot of things that uh, can be used, but the service as a whole, as of now, um, no, we're trying to figure out uh, what's next. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Now, a question again from the chat, for Alex. So, he's apologizing, uh, Pietro is apologizing for uh, its bad connection, but the question is, are you integrating satellite data in disease management models? In this case, which kind of data? So the disease models? Yes. No, no data was from satellite was integrated in the disease models. Uh, the disease models has, are based on uh, climatological data and weather data, as well as uh, infield data taken by the by the users. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, uh, maybe there is another in the chat, but you can give the floor also again to the room. Any question from the audience? F Fran, Marina, you could give the. Micro to Fran, yeah. Yeah, um, I saw when, when you were showing the, the prediction of, um, of the disease uh, occurrence that you were providing also a, a, a recommended volume rate of application of pesticide. Uh, I would like to know, because we, we, we work on this, so I would like to know where this is, who is taking this decision? Is it a model that you have developed? Is uh, the user who... Uh, tells you that, or how, how does it come from? Yeah, um, actually, for this for this part of the service, I, I'm today here in uh, instead of a colleague of mine that actually designed uh, this service. Um, the the models that we design uh, based on AI, on AI basically um, work on the part of the uh, disease prediction. So for the part of the recommendation. Uh, I, I believe um, that the recommendations uh, still follow like these this mechanistical uh, models based on the results of the of the uh, AI predictions. Yeah. Okay, thank you. If, if I may help on that, because I've been a bit involved too, I think that one of the, the parameters is the historical, uh, I would say, um, activities or decisions made by the, our end users on how they applied some of the products there. But also I think that uh, the lie index, so the leaf area index also involved on that, uh, I don't know, quantification of the amount. But yeah. I said, yeah, it should be, it's a, a one colleague that couldn't uh, join us today, but who has more expertise on that, but I think that both, both uh, sources of data are considered. Yeah, it, it will make sense. For, for the next BT, BTGOS2, you, you can use, you have a lot of data from that you showed, and there are already published uh, um, um, factors that can convert the biomass and leaf area index and all these. So it would be, probably you are using already that, but, uh, but I think you get a lot of information from the, from the, from the remote sensing, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's plenty of factors to to get this, uh, this value, so it's good, good. Yeah, and then dependent on the, the type of interaction between end user and platform, um, it could either be that a consultant has part of the platform and that tweaks that kind of data. Um, we also have different vineyards in the platform currently. Some of them uh, practice organic standards, so yeah, different, uh, different information needed. Um, and of course, everyone makes their own decisions as well, so it's really uh, yeah, a first step in, in trying to get somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, I think that it's time. Uh, so uh, I think that we now it's time for a break. I would thank you a lot for the speakers today. Now, because you have maintained the time very, very well, so it gives us the floor for more questions than expected. So thank you all for joining, and thank you all the people online are here. I think it's time for a break. So I give uh, also the, now the floor to uh, Laia, who will get yeah, just back. just uh, ten minutes uh, break.
just to prepare the, the last session of today. So you have 10 minutes to go to the bathroom or whatever, <laughs> and then go back at 12.15. Thank you. Thank you.